So, Andrew, this was quite a ruling on Friday night. I want to start with you, because in her ruling, she references history. She kind of reminds us of core principles relating to equal justice, or that's how I read it as a non-lawyer. But how did you read it, and what does it say about where we are as a country that a judge even needs to put this in writing? I think there are two points. One is this really is an example of the judiciary standing up for the rule of law. Uh, and her opinion on Friday was magisterial in doing that. In terms of the history of where we are as a country, I think Judge Chutkin's um, evoking George Washington's farewell speech, uh, mm -hmm. I thought, was brilliant. I'm just going to take a moment just to quote a little portion of that, because it's just so telling that George Washington, as our first president, saw this coming and said, with respect mm. to the idea of a president not being subject to the rule of law, being exempt from criminal prosecution, would lead to the following. And I'm quoting from George Washington, which Judge Shutkin quotes from, "'Cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people mm -hmm. and usurp for themselves the reins of government. Um, that is clearly a reference to the allegations here in the case before her with respect to Donald Trump. It's pretty stunning. I mean, given that was literally hundreds of years ago, as everyone knows, what that could see ahead to and what our founders were thinking about. So, so Neil, one of the big questions here is, of course, what happens now? Um, and there is this theory, of course, that this will go to the Supreme Court. You said this ruling is such a, a slam dunk that the Supreme Court isn't likely to take it up. And given how many cases you've argued, I thought that really stuck out to me. Why don't you think they would? Because everything Donald Trump says, like in those clips you just showed, is bogus, like 100 percent bogus, Jen. Um, I've taught constitutional law 20 times at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. I've been the president's top lawyer before the Supreme Court. And I can tell you, nobody thinks that this is the law. And, you know, not even a student in 20 years would defend this kind of Richard Nixon-esque principle that Donald Trump is saying. And, you know, I, I think we should take Trump's argument for what it is. This is not a good faith argument about the Constitution, because mm. no scholar would support him. This is just about delay. Remember, when he was president, he said, I can't be tried because I'm a sitting president. Now he's saying, I can't be tried because I'm running to be president. And later, he's, his lawyers have said in Georgia, just this week, if he wins the election, then he can't be tried until 2029. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, they're just saying Donald Trump can't be tried on any day of the week that ends in the letter Y. Um, it's ridiculous. Now, <laughs> it will go up to the, the to the D.C. Circuit, to the mm -hmm. Court of Appeals, where I suspect it'll be rejected pretty quickly because of that ruling you mentioned earlier earlier on the civil case. I think that will control this. And then the Supreme Court has the choice to hear this case or not. And there's just not any real good argument on the merits for Donald Trump. And so I think they can dispose of this case quickly. And I think the trial can proceed on March 4th, as it should. So, Andrew, as, as Neil referenced, I mean, I, I don't think anyone here is validating, and most people wouldn't val validate the legal argument, but it only requires four justices to agree to take up a case, right, to the Supreme Court. And many of them are Trump appointees. I know this isn't how it's supposed to work, but that's why I want to ask the question. Do you agree they wouldn't take it up? And, and if they did, what, what could be the—what what impact could that have? How could that help Trump, even if they didn't rule in his favor? Well, the only way that the March 4th trial is not going to happen, because Judge Chutkin is adamant she is going to have it on that date, and jury selection is actually starting in January, just a few weeks from now, is whether the D.C. Circuit is going to move with alacrity and then whether the Supreme Court is going to take the case and issue a stay. Um, I think this is an instance where, as Martin Luther King said, justice too long delayed is justice denied. It is imperative mm. that the judiciary act quickly on this. I totally agree with uh, my law partner for the show, uh, <laughs> Neil, that this is not a meritorious uh, claim. I am worried about the speed, though. And this is, mm. you know, this is a failing in our judicial system that um, the former president takes advantage of, it is truly imperative that justice be meted out quickly here if the American public is going to see accountability in this case. Whichever way the jury decides, it is important to have that accountability. 
So, Neil, in, in terms of the process here, um, you know, what does the timeline look like? And that is the, the delay here. You brought this up. Andrew brought this up. What are we looking at and what concerns you the most about that possibility? Well, I think that to the extent that Trump wants to try and seek a stay of the trial, he'd have to go to the court pretty quickly to the D.C. Circuit and seek that and then seek a quick appeal. I do think that the circuit will order quick briefing and quick oral argument on that. And then they'll try the Trump. I suspect Trump will lose, and then he'll try and take it to the U.S. Supreme Court again. I think all of that can be done very, very quickly. And you know, sure, Jen, you're right that there are several Trump appointees on the court, but I think it's important to remember those very Trump appointees voted against Donald Trump, for example, mm -hmm. when Trump tried to, tried to claim executive privilege uh, over the January 6th committee. All the Trump appointees rejected that. It was an eight to one mm -hmm. decision against him. In the independent state legislature case I just argued, which had a lot of political valence, again, you saw the Republican appointed justices still siding with the over with the vast majority of the court to say uh, this theory was bogus. So, you know, I think that there's, you know, particularly for a case like this in which there's really no decent argument that Donald Trump has, I don't see this as slowing down a trial. And I think Andrew's absolutely right. The American public deserve answers. And, you know, if Trump is convicted, convinced he did nothing wrong, then go and prove that up to a jury. He's going to have to he's going to have every advantage at his disposal because the criminal justice system bends totally in favor of defendants. The prosecution has to convince all 12 jurors mm -hmm. that Trump is guilty and under the most difficult standard in the law beyond a reasonable doubt. That's such an important reminder, and, and you're the expert on this, too, and how these cases have been argued, even as frustrated as we can all be at moments with the Supreme Court and some decisions. I want to ask you, Andrew, before I let you guys go, Trump's legal team also argued that because he wasn't convicted during his impeachment, he should not be able to face criminal prosecution. I mean, there's all sorts of issues with that, but explain why that doesn't hold up. Well, what he is referring to is the uh, double jeopardy clause, where you can't be tried twice for the same crime. The problem for him is that the reason this is such a frivolous argument is an impeachment is not a criminal proceeding. But even if it were, even if you assume that, what he was um, being impeached for is insurrection, and that is not what he is charged with. So mm -hmm. under the technical rules of double jeopardy, it simply doesn't apply. That is one of the really frivolous arguments um, that is disposed of by Judge Chuckin. I can't see any court agreeing um, with Donald Trump's position on this. It's, there's really nothing to worry about in this argument. Andrew Weissman and Neil Katyal, always a pleasure. I always learn something. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon.